Sarah Burkhardt, I'm an undergraduate at Arizona State, and I'm working with Dr. Witt, who is a professor of astronomy here at UT, and we've been looking into the abundance of small dust grains relative to larger dust grains in the interstellar medium. Um, you can see the darker regions, those are dust clouds in the black and plain. Um, they exist everywhere, but you just can't see them at higher and lower latitudes because of lack of contrast. Um, so dust absorbs starlight. Um, it's heated by the photons, and then it emits an infrared, so you can use infrared instruments. Um, so this is the dust emission spectrum. We're focusing on the um, 12 micron peak, which is emitted by the smaller dust grains, and the 100 micron peak, which is emitted by the larger colder dust grains. So um, PA stands for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. And um, polycyclic is the multiple loop structure. Um, aromatic is the strong uh, chemical carbon bond. And hydrocarbon is hydrogen and carbon atoms. And you can see the difference in the scale here between the smaller grains and the large grains, they're about a hundredth of the linear size and about six orders of magnitude, smaller than the large grains. So these um, smaller, these paws are really vulnerable in extreme environments to excitation and even destruction. So these are the dust emission maps that we used. Um, they were both taken by um, space telescopes because um, the Earth's atmosphere absorbs a lot of the infrared waves. So on the top, we have the IRAS 100 micron map. Um, IRAS went up in 83, and it was the first space telescope to do an all-sky survey. Um, and its resolution is about four to six arc minutes per pixel. And then on the bottom is the WISE um, W312 micron map. So that detects the smaller grains. And that was launched in 09. And this map was actually just processed and released this year um, by um, Meisner and Kingfinder at Harvard, so these haven't really been studied too much yet until now. So um, the maps look similar, but we're looking for um, significant variations between them and looking into why those exist. So this cloud is NBM30. Um, we decided to look at some high latitude clouds that were far enough away from the hot stars that they wouldn't be receiving direct UV radiation, and also clouds that aren't so dense that. Uh, the radiation would be blocked from the dust grains on the inside of the cloud. And they're small enough that we can get a high range of intensities in a small space. We can analyze these with one tile each. So we looked at this one and another one <coughs> called NBM32. And you can see the linear relationship here between the smaller grains and the large grains. The ratio is about 2.8. And so we expect this ratio with, throughout the interstellar medium as long as the, um, the um, paws haven't been destroyed and there's no direct UV radiation. So one environment where we expect paws to be destroyed is inside a supernova remnant um, because of the shock wave, the high velocity shock wave and the hot gas within the remnant. And this graph shows, um, it's a theoretical model of the dust grains, and um, the paws are this dotted line here. So the black shows the volume before the shock wave, and the red shows after. And you can see there's no paws after the shock wave, so we expect all of them to be destroyed. So the first one we looked at was the North Polar Spur, and um, this is like an all-sky map, so you can see how big that feature is. Um, so we had to look at it through we had to use three different, like 10 by 10 degree tiles to get a good um, evaluation of this. And what we found is that the ratio of paws to larger grains is only slightly smaller. This red line represents the 2.8 slope that we expect. Um, but if any paws were destroyed, it, it wasn't many according to this data. So we decided to look at another supernova remnant, which is the Cygnus loop. Now, at first, our data showed that the ratio was actually higher than we expected, which was kind of strange. So we looked into that further, and we found that um, some of the, there was a colder area 
area where some of the larger grains um, were just a degree cooler, but that can make a big difference in emissions. So we corrected for that using the pike function. And we found that the slope is lower, but still not by much. We expected it to be, you know, zero, but it's not. So we moved on to looking at um, optically thick clouds. This is NVM 12, it's a high latitude cloud. And um, you can see that the ratio is pretty much in line with expected, a little bit higher until the um, large grain emissions reach about 12, and then the slope levels out, the pause stop increasing. And that's because um, of the skin effect. The UV radiation is being absorbed by the larger grains on the outside, and it can't get inside the cloud, so that just kind of levels out at that point. Um, this data looks similar. This is NBM6, but this one's not optically thick. You can see that it starts leveling out a lot earlier at about five. So, um, and there's also a lot of scattering, and we're not sure why that is, so that, that requires further investigation. Um, so, this is the PAW absorption spectra. Um, you can see that the PAWs prefer a small range of UV um, waves, and these are um, theoretical models and um, at about 13.6 electron volts, the paws are going to be destroyed. So, um, whereas the larger grains can absorb a much wider range of UV radiation. So we wanted to see um, what happens when the paws are closer to a radiation source, like hot OB stars that are underneath this cloud, which is LBN 1780. Um, so this graph shows the, um, the ratio as a function of position, starting from the north and going south. And the blue is the um, regions on the left, and red is on the right. And you can see um, a peak in emissions here from the pause at the bottom of the cloud. And that's because of that radiation coming directly from the south. So we looked at another really good example of direct UV radiation, this is Pleiades, and the stars are embedded in the dust clouds. So what we did is we took regions going radially outward in regions that didn't interfere with other stars just to see um, what the emissions did. And these are some examples of some of the most intense and brightest stars. And you can see the intensity levels are sometimes double and even triple of our expected value, and then it decreases as it goes out. So these are the um, ratios from LDN 1780 and Pleiades, and it shows that UV radiation definitely does increase the ratio of pause to small grains. So our conclusions are that um, we didn't find any strong evidence to support cloud destruction um, in supernova remnants, which was actually pretty surprising. Um, that pause emissions are lower inside of optically thick, dense clouds and that um, PAW emissions are significantly higher when they're close to a UV radiation source. And thanks to Dr. Witt and Rick and Allison for your place today. Any questions for Sarah? Yes. So for the Pleiades, did you offer any of your objects since they have, they span some space on the, in the sky, are those a, a, an accumulation of all the data points over the region that you had data? Um, we like, use it's like the Pleiades, for instance. Let me go back to. So for these, this was just a sample of um, some of the stronger ones because I couldn't fit all the graphs on one. But these data points were taken um, throughout the cloud to get a good sample, get a good range of what was happening all over the cloud. We went across and through and, and around the outside. So for the Pleiades, can you learn to picture for the Pleiades? Yes. So 
did you include, I don't, maybe Adolf can answer this question, did you include the molecular cloud to the south of Morope? Oh, yeah. yeah, we did. Actually, this graph shows um, Morope here. This one is only going south because it's in other directions. It was touched other stars, but this is that cloud right here. Um, so there was kind of a thicker cloud beneath it, and it, it was receiving that radiation from the I have a little bit of a stinker question. This is not you, you do awesome <laughs> stuff. But, so I was just wondering, with these guys, um, you were saying in, um, you had to account for colder than average dust in um, that one supernova remnant. Did you look for any, could there be any dust temperature effects close to these OB stars that need accounting for before you do the ratio of the pHs to the large grains? Um, well, the, um, the large grains, so the large grains were the ones that were mostly affected in this one as far as we could tell. It's really hard to correct for the small grains. No, they, no, no, that's what I mean, the large grains. Yeah, grain. so they're not, the t their temperatures aren't affected as much by the direct heat as the paws are. So we, we didn't really do any corrections for that. I don't know if you affect what has anything else. No, I mean, in this particular case, there's a temperature gradient. And is there in the OB, in the Pleiades, for the large grains, is there a temperature gradient a, that needs to be accounted for uh, in her plots? Yeah, I mean, we, we, did, we did not. Obviously, the temperature would be higher near the stars, so and if you were to make that correction, the deviation would be even greater, because the... Uh, yeah. you know, so I guess it's not a stinker question. It, it might even make the results stronger. Right, it would make it even stronger. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it was already strong enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't able to catch, what's the difference between the red line and the blue line and all these pictures? Oh, the red is the expected, that 2.8 ratio that came from the high latitude clouds that were kind of in their own environment. And then the blue, sometimes it was black for some reason, but that is the ratio on the plot. Yeah. So both are actually going to appear to be present here. I mean, there's that little tail that follows the red for a little bit. Is that real um, or is that just... Uh, yeah, it kind of does. And we um, we had initially scanned like pretty far on either side and on the top and on the bottom, but this particular plot was taken only with this here. And everything within here would be expected to have some kind of paw destruction um, because the hot gas exists everywhere inside here. So, yeah. And so a lot of these pixel by pixel plots are very linear, but some show sort of different degrees of turnovers. Mm -hmm. Is that physically significant? Or is that just due to the instrumentation? Um, right, yeah, so the last like one shows a little bit, this is a little bit more, and I think the next one's even stronger. Right, so this one, um, we're not really sure. We would have to look into that one further. This one is definitely because at this point it gets optically thick. It's, it's too thick on the outside for these inside paws to be getting any radiation. That's going to white out levels out there. Your uh, absorption graph, I think it's a couple back. Uh, I missed, where did you get the data from there? Um, this was from a paper. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So there's raw data there, and then there's also the model, right? Yeah, so this was experimental data about. that they did. Yeah, it actually turned out pretty well. It's really um, very challenging to make the ionized pause in the lab. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And 13.6 is interesting when you mention right. that number. Right. Yeah, so because in um, tied with hydrogen there. In H2 regions, they don't find pause. Okay. So ionized hydrogen um, and pause don't exist in the same areas. Any more questions for Sarah? All right. Thanks.